Maria said uh, the um, – just going to try and advance here. As Maria said, I do have a farm. I'm uh, a new farmer myself as well. Um, we established in 2011, and we work on about two and a quarter acres, um, have um, about 80 families in our CSA, and we sell to a couple of markets. So we are strictly uh, pretty much manual, except for a BCS that we use um, every now and then. Um, but uh, my very first year of being certified was in 2013, and uh, it's been a, uh, it was a great way to really build confidence with our customers uh, as we were opening our business. Okay, so the first thing I think you need to know about certified organic record keeping is that record keeping is actually a regulation and it's part of the national organic program. And the formal wording I put here, I won't read it, but it just, uh, basically tells you if you're going to certify, you have to maintain records. Otherwise, there would be no way for a certifier and inspector to actually know if you're doing uh, right by the National Organic Program. Uh, they need to see things that you've written down because they can't be there with you the whole time. So the good news is they don't really give you a template to use. You don't have to use their template. You can adapt the records that um, is appropriate for your size and, and um, type of business. So they're not too picky about that. As long as, and they're not really picky about whether it's computerized or written, just so long as you keep the records um, enough for them to be able to tell. Um, and that's the last point. The certified operation must make such records available for inspection and copying during normal business hours by authorized representatives. So um, I do uh, play a role as an organic inspector and um, I've, I've been very impressed with some of the ingenuity of people um, out there to take really good uh, and really good records. And of course, it helps their, their business anyway to do so. Okay, so um, one of the good news about uh, farms, if you're thinking about certifying, is that if you have land that has had no prohibited substances applied in the last three years, then you can certify rather quickly. Uh, you don't need to wait three years after you've been on the property if somebody else has managed, managed it organically in the last three years. And so this little chart at the bottom um, is taken directly out of the Bay State Organic forms that you would fill out. And this is what they would have the prior land owner or prior farm manager attest to. Um, they would ask what crops and inputs you would be entering for uh, 2017. They would ask what the manager planted in 2016 and what inputs they used in terms of fertilizers or um, other uh, compost and so forth. And for three years, they would document those items and the manager would sign off on each year. And this is what would enable a farm to actually move forward with an application, let's say this month, and be certified for their, um, their crops to be sold as organic um, eight weeks from now. So it can be relatively quickly, if nothing, uh, on your land that you own or rent um, is, has been, uh, nothing prohibited has been used. So that's a really good um, thing that sometimes people think they have to wait and uh, you may not have to. Um, one of the biggest things about record keeping and having an organic farm is most importantly to use uh, allowed substances. And very often people um, will look up substances or maybe it has an OMRI label on the, on the bag and they say, okay, this is fine, which it will uh, be fine. Uh, but one, one of the distinctions you need to make on your paperwork when you're documenting which inputs you're using um, you have three different categories of input. You have allowed, and you have allowed with restrictions, and you have prohibited. So you never use the prohibited one. But um, when you have a restricted product, um, and I will give you an example here in a second, um, you can look at your product before you go ahead and put your farm plan together and before you order products, uh, and before certainly that you put them on your field, uh, you want to look them up on omri.org. And you put the name of the product and, and sometimes even the company 
And up on that screen will come a, a box that looks very similar to this. This is Dipel, which is often used for um, keeping the cabbages from eating all of your kale and, and so forth, or the cabbage moths and the cabbage worms. Um, this particular product, if you look it up, would say allowed with restriction. So it is an R. And once a product is an R, you have to demonstrate what you're doing to comply with the annotation. And the annotation in this case is a number here, and it's numbered 205.206E. What that annotation means, uh, if you were to read this regulation, is that it requires you to do certain things uh, before you can actually use this product to kill your caterpillars. So they simplify it here by saying it requires the use of pre preventative, mechanical, physical, and other pest, weed, and disease management practices. So when you're applying for your certification and when you are keeping your records about your uh, pest problem in your field, uh, you may have a note that says, you know, we've got five worms per plant. You would record that in your records knowing that you need to do something about it. And then you would, you know, apply Dipel in a, in a uh, backpack sprayer. Um, but before you did that, on your, um, your management practice in your file, you would actually say things like, we plant them with proper spacing. We cover them with remay. Um, we uh, keep it well weeded. So these are all cu cultural practices that you actually do in order uh, to have these preventative practices in place. Um, so sometimes when people are filling out their applications for organic certification, this confuses them. They put all A's, allowed, allowed, allowed. But in fact, what, what they want to see is for you to look them up and say, are they allowed or are they restricted? If they are restricted, then just write down your cultural practices of what you are doing to prevent that pest. Uh, and when those things fail, then you are going to use Dipel, for example. So anything that's restricted, you would want to have a similar plan. I know that could be a little complicated, but it's the most common <laughs> mistake that um, applicants make, uh, that they don't understand the A, R, and the P. Okay? Okay. Um, so this is the actual regulation, 205.206E. And, <clears throat> um, and this is what the table would look like in your in your application. So Diapel is there, the brand, the manufacturer's Valiant Biosciences, it is an R. And these are the types of cultural practices that the farm might utilize in order to prevent that um, butterfly from laying eggs on their brassicas. Okay, so that's just an example. Okay. The, the, the last thing that you want to do once you are certified or if you are not yet applied for certification but would like to, um, the worst thing you could do is jeopardize your certification by applying something that was uh, not allowed. So um, it's very important that you follow that. That's probably the most important thing, um, documenting that uh, search for those inputs and writing down and making sure not to use them if they are prohibited. And it may seem like a simple thing, but people make mistakes all the time. You know, maybe they thought they ordered something and it comes in and then it's in the barn and then it gets used and it's, it's, um, it's setting it back quite a bit. What? So um, keep your fertility input on a list and um, you'll be in much better shape. When you're applying them in the field, you're going to want to record on a, on a record, uh, just like you do when um, and many of you probably have been to uh, training on um, the state requirements for uh, insecticide and pesticide applications. They, ha they have a little form that you can fill out for using uh, conventional um, pesticides, as, um, you can use those here as well. Record when, where, and how much you used on the field and why. So you would put a date, the field ID or number, or perhaps you have a name for the field or the bed, and on what crop you used it, the quantity, so how much you mixed in with water or other um, materials, 
did you apply it with a backpack sprayer or another type of sprayer and your reason for use. So this is a record that you would make on your uh, applying your um, input. Okay, so many of you may um, like to use compost because it does in, improve our organic matter. And um, there is a rule within the National Organic Program that requires certified organic farms to use compost that's been approved for organic farms. Compost can't be certified, so that's not how we call it, uh, but it can be approved for organic use. And if it's approved for organic use, we can use it at any time during our growing season. This comes in especially handy when we're doing um, a lot of intensive succession planting on, on uh, one bed where we might have three or four crops during the season. You're gonna, many farmers are gonna wanna use compost on that bed um, after the first crop is done. Unless that compost is approved for organic use, you can't use it during the growing season. Um, so you would have to, um, to use it at an earlier date in the fall uh, before the following harvest season. So this organic rule for um, compost requires certain things. And the chart that I've given you here is how you would record producing your compost in order for you to be able to use it on your organic farm. So there is a, a record requirement. They want you to record the date, the temperature. Um, you're actually gonna record several dates because you want it to be uh, between 131 uh, degrees and 170 degrees uh, for 15 days. So the, when you record it, you're gonna wanna reflect that requirement in your, in your um, record keeping um, and your actual production. Um, it matters whether you're doing a windrow pile or a static pile um, and how many times you're going to turn it uh, is five times. So you're going to want to record each date that you turn your, your pile. Um, when you start out your compost, they're going to want to know what you put in it. This is just an example of how you would record it. Now you'll notice this compost does not have any manure in it. So this particular um, compost would not necessarily need to be followed. With, this procedure would not need to be filed if you don't have manure in it. But um, there are various calculators online that you can search for that will tell you the carbon to nitrogen ratio of each material that you would add to your compost. And uh, in this particular example, um, I, I selected 200 pounds of brown leaves and 17 pounds of grass and 12 pounds of vegetable scraps and calculated um, a CNN ratio of 33 to one. This is the, the, what the, um, they would like you to have, somewhere between 25 to one carbon to nitrogen and 40 to one carbon to nitrogen. So these are the, um, in order to um, use your compost, you have to get it uh, approved for use by your certifier. So if you keep records for this and ask them to, cert to come and in, inspect your compost production, they will approve it for organic use, assuming you're keeping the right record. Okay. Um, if compost is not approved in the, in the way that I've just said, then that compost has to be used just like manure. So in other words, you can't put it on during the growing season. You have to put it on in the fall uh, because they, they're not sure that it's finished compost uh, for you to be able to use within the growing season. So you have to treat that compost. Or let's just say you get compost from a, a neighbor farmer and they, they're not approved for organic use. You would treat that just like you would manure. Put it on in the fall. You don't need to worry about you know, calculating the dates. They're still going to want you to record that what was your manure application date, which, what was the field ID, how much did you put on, and what, what are you planting there, and what's your expected harvest date? Because what they're looking for there is if you're growing crops for human consumption, uh, you want to apply your manure no later than 90 days prior to the first harvest if that particular crop does not touch the ground. So for example, tomatoes or uh, no later than 120 days prior to the first harvest uh, if the produce touches the ground, like lettuce, lettuce heads. 
So your compost and your manure application, you would do the same thing, record your dates, your field IDs, and um, the amounts, um, and what crops you're going to be planting there. Okay. So one of the things that uh, when you're certified organic, uh, you'll have an inspector come out once a year to inspect you. Uh, sometimes if you're brand new, um, a brand new farm, they might come twice just to see how you did in keeping your records after, after your, um, your growing season, you know, once in the spring and then once in the fall, they might come. Um, but one of the things that they will do when they visit you is a um, crop audit at inspection. And so the records are your only way of uh, accomplishing this uh, crop audit successfully. So the first thing, and I call this seed to table record keeping. So the first thing you want to do is keep all your invoices from your seed company so that they can look at those. Now, they're going to want to look through um, your seed packages too. Those are also considered records and all your records you want to keep for five years. So um, keep your seed packets, even if you put all the empty ones in a container uh, that they can look through, that's fine too. But you're going to want to keep your invoices for seed companies for all your, your purchases. Um, you're, they're going to want to see your seed package inventory. And you also, um, if you're using any non-organic seeds, you're going to want to show them um, your search record. So, if, for example, I was recently looking for um, purple cauliflower, and um, I looked at um, high mowing, I looked at uh, Johnny's, I looked at Fedco, I might have looked at a couple others uh, too, but I wrote down in my record book that I searched those websites, and I, I even called somebody, maybe Baker Creek, to see if they had it organic. Nobody had it, so in that case, I was able to order the non-organic seeds. Um, so you need to show the inspector your um, efforts there in some fashion. Um, websites, phone numbers, that those are all acceptable. Um, and the next part of the seed audit is really showing them your, uh, your production uh, schedule. So what date did you seed the um, seed in the greenhouse? Um, or in the field, if it's a, a direct seeded product, what was the um, transplant date and which field number did it go into? Um, you're also going to want to record all your application uh, inputs. So the date, the type of fertilizer or insecticide, and the amounts um, that you use on that crop. Uh, those are especially important to keep track of. Harvest is another area where they want to see exactly what you've harvested. So I'm going to show you a couple of sheets um, and a little bit uh, of examples of some harvest records. Not only do they want to see what you've harvested, um, but they want to see, uh, and if we were doing this audit just on tomatoes, they would like to see you know, a, a record of you having harvested those tomatoes, what field they came from, as well as how many pounds of, of tomatoes uh, you had. And then the last record um, of the seed to table uh, audit would be uh, a sales record of the tomatoes. Um, so, you know, it could either be a, um, a sales receipt from a restaurant. It could be just your um, harvest record for your CSA for that day. Uh, and it might also be a record of your market, your farmer's market sales. So however you keep your sales records, um, then that would be how you would show them that that was uh, sold. So think about that crop audit from seed to sale when you're thinking about how you're going to set up your records because it will it'll really help you um, go forward. Now sometimes they might ask you to do an inspector might ask you to do more than one audit, um, but generally they're going to do at least one of these on on most inspections. Okay, so um, a couple of the other things that you need to just prove by keeping your records, um, organic, not only the organic seed, but also planting stock. So if you're ordering um, um, corns or uh, roots or other types of uh, maybe seed potatoes, 
you're going to want to keep track of those as well, and also your search for um, finding certified organic um, stock. Um, so all of these things, um, as I mentioned, the soil fertility records are really important for you to keep. Um, your other management practices are also important to keep, but um, I, I, I would kind of doubt that an inspector is going to ask you, show me when you weeded your tomatoes, okay? Uh, they really do care about the ones that I've, that I've already gone through. Um, if there's a question about your management practices, uh, you know, they're going to be able to see that in, in the field, you know, whether it's, you know, very weedy or, um, you know, the things that are just not, uh, thriving um, uh, because the soil fertility may not be there yet, but um, the items that I've mentioned are really the most important um, parts of um, of keeping the organic record. Okay, so um, for those of you who haven't applied for certification, uh, when we talk about the organic farm plan, this is a document of about 13 pages with lots of attachments to it. Um, the some people, you know, think of um, of uh, a plan being something like a strategic plan or a marketing plan or something like that. <clears throat> so don't get scared away by thinking this is a, a plan that you have to develop and research and write out. It really is just an application. Uh, the plan is an application, but it also outlines your practices that enables the certifier to um, understand that you are following the National Organic Program. So um, the organic plan will list all of your substances. It'll list all your monitoring procedures, whether you get soil tests or water tests, or if you do tissue tests on your plants. Um, and it will be, a, you know, really a document that describes your rec record keeping system. And often it's just a matter of you checking boxes to show exactly what uh, type of records you are going to keep. And if you do check boxes saying you're going to keep a record, you're going to want to do that absolutely because they will ask to see it. Okay, so there's a lot of things that you could keep, and um, I know many of us are not the same type uh, type A personalities that love to keep records. Some people would like to be very simple and um, and and make that sufficient, and there's definitely a way for you to do that. You know, I think some of the most important ways that for my farm that I can keep, um, that's easy for me to keep, um, many of you uh, may use Excel for your production plans, um, but many of you may also be using a software uh, system, which is great because you can just um, point to that when you're in an inspection and, and, um, and show them your records. Um, uh, I generally keep a clipboard uh, in the truck each day that I write down, you know, our planned work for the day and and um, and what we've actually uh, accomplished. So um, those, if I have time at the end of the season, I do put in the computer, but oftentimes I don't have time. And um, so when the inspector comes, I'll just get them out and, and show them, you know, when I planted the tomatoes uh, for the audit and so forth. But um, the um, it, it just makes it really simple to record stuff you do for the day. Um, um, and I think everybody has a little bit different way of doing that. Some people just take photos, which is also a good way to document uh, things. It's also considered a record. A photo is definitely a record. Um, so the field activity log um, uh, that that I sometimes will transfer to a computer just to give me a search ability um, is helpful. Um, I also have um, attempted to save it on Dropbox and actually use my Excel sheets from the field when I'm planting. Um, it's sometimes difficult when you're all muddy to do that, but um, I know others that I've seen out in the field have used devices uh, quite successfully in entering um, their activity, which is, is very helpful. But either way you do it, you just have to do it. And then again, um, for harvest sheets, uh, I'm going to show you uh, one that, uh, that I use for CSA as well as one for market that has all the requ required information that, that uh, the inspector is going to need. Uh, to see when they come and do uh, their inspection. And lastly, one, one of the items that I don't keep records of because I don't do a lot of crop storage and transport, um, this really would be about if you're 
storing stuff for the winter um, and you have winter markets, this would be very important for your farm to keep records of uh, what you're putting in storage, what date you put it in there, you know, perhaps when you need to sell it by. Um, and also if you have uh, other companies transporting uh, food for you, you're going to want to keep a record uh, of those sorts of things. So um, that's very important too. I, you know, you w I don't necessarily keep track of my tr own personal transport of my products to the farmer's market because it's me doing it and I don't have um, a third party, uh, so I don't really keep a record of that. But uh, you should if you are doing um, that sort of thing. Okay. Okay, so this is an example of a harvest record for CSA, and really the important part of this is the field number. Um, especially, you know, th this is one thing I was missing on my first inspection, and they came back in the fall to look at me uh, to make sure that I had filled in the f uh, field number at all of my, um, uh, for all of my harvests. And then um, this would be a record that I would take out to the field on CSA day that I'm doing, you know, 14 individuals, 14 full shares. Um, uh, these are the pounds that I, uh, or the eaches that I'm going to need. And then the actual would go in this column. And basically, before I take anything off the truck, I bring the scale over, put it on the back of the pickup truck, weigh everything, and, and then the record's done. And um, sometimes, as I mentioned, I can, I'll put this transfer to an Excel sheet so I can add up what I did each year. Um, um, I, and I just put the pounds in. If, if I do any record transition onto the computer, it's those pounds. It just gives me um, a really good way to look at, have I improved? Have I, have I gone backwards? Have I made my, the totals that I thought I was going to make? Or, or did I get the right yields in those beds? So um, that is one thing that I always do at the end of the season. And this is the farmer's uh, market harvest record. It's a little bit more difficult to see, but um, same thing, field number, um, the quantity I want to take to market, and the pounds that I um, actually harvested. Um, I'm lucky I have back-to-back -back markets on Saturday and Sunday, so whatever I, I didn't sell, I, I calculate, um, and it goes to the market the second day. And then I have another quantity of stuff that, um, that I actually – need to harvest and how many pounds that is. So, and then down here is where at the end of the market um, is where I write down how much my sales were um, for the market from my cash box. And this gives me a really good record of what my sales were from the farmer's market. At the end of the year, you know, I have 40 markets for the year. I add them all up and that's my farmer's market sales. Um, those sales are really uh, part of the total sales after the CSA that I have to report to my uh, certifier. Okay, the field activity log. Um, this is what my field activity looks like. Um, I've come up with a Excel sheet again that has the date, the field number, um, what um, block it is. So an acre of my field might be block A, B, C, and D. And then I have um, about uh, between one and a hundred, you know, beds in that, in that particular block. And then I've just come up with, with abbreviations tilled and we made uh, uh, beds. The R stands for just making um, raised bed with our um, rotary plow. Uh, what it is that might have gone in there and um, how many pl plants, and if I used a, a drench or something to, um, to actually plant that bed, I'll note it here. So this way I've got one record for all of my, um, all my field work basically, except for harvesting. And I use those other sheets for the harvesting. And that, that, is, uh, that simplifies it for me. Okay. So this list is actually the exact list that's on um, the last page of an organic crop plan or organic farm plan. And this list is one that um, the certifier would actually have you check off of all of those things that you're keeping. Um, so if you're not keeping them, 
uh, you don't have to check them. But if you are keeping them, check them. There are certain things on here that they will require that you must keep, things like field maps. So I think I, I think even if you're not a certified farm, you're keeping field maps because you want to know, you know, where you planted things in the past so that you have good crop rotation, crop rotation records. Um, you definitely uh, are keeping these. So those are something that would be uh, part of your your crop plan uh, when you send it in. Field activity log, um, if you're a new farm just certifying, you just have to give them a blank template of what you're going to do. You don't have to uh, have something already in place. And the field history sheets um, are those sheets that I showed you uh, at the very beginning that had the signature on them. Um, after your farm is certified for the first time, you keep those up to date every year. So then you just move, you know, the 20, you put another year of 2018 in, and then you just do the last three years. So it really is just a matter of updating the most current year uh, each year. Uh, documentation of previous land use or rented or purchased land, that, that's a document um, that we, we talked about early on. Um, but sometimes you may have a new field that, that you've rented uh, maybe you've moved, uh, this would be required each time you did that. Um, input records, uh, as we mentioned, for soil amend amendments, seed manure, foliar sprays, and pest control. Um, documentation of your attempts to source organic seeds and planting stock, and um, the documentation of bought in organic produce for resale. So if you um, want to fill out your CSA, sometimes uh, farmers will buy from other farmers to um, have them available within your CSA. Um, if they are certified organic, um, you really just have to have um, a uh, invoice uh, or a sales receipt for that from that farm. And if they are um, certified organic by base date, um, there's not too much else you need to do. If they're not certified by base state, you would need to get a copy of their certificate of uh, organic certification to um, send in to base state as part of your dossier. Um, what the certifier worries about in terms of farms buying in other uh, farms produce is if they are not organic and you are certified organic. And what they worry about is how you uh, prevent the commingling of the organic with the non-organic product. <laughs> so you have to really sit down and think about this and write out your procedures. So for example, um, if you were bringing in um, uh, non-organic produce and, and, and putting it in the bag with the organic produce, are they touching? Um, or is the non-organic product completely wrapped in some fashion? not to contaminate the organic. Um, if your customers, you know, pack their own bags or boxes when they come to the farm, um, or if you have it commingled on your farm stand table, you have to think about how you can keep those separate. And that will be something if you're selling both organic and non-organic products, uh, Base State will be really interested in your plan of how you're going to keep those separate whether it be in the freezer or the cooler or um, in the transport truck. Um, the best way to really go about that is to write a plan and then stick to it. So, for example, you might have a different color bin for those things and you'll keep them completely separate. Um, so you need to think through that and that will be something that um, that Bay State will, will definitely pursue when they um, talk through your uh, application. Um, Sales records, as I mentioned, purchase order, contract, invoice, cash receipts, sales journal. Um, the documentation of organic seedlings. So sometimes there are farms that, um, that buy seedlings in, especially maybe grafted tomato plants or, or whatnot. Um, you'll need to make sure you have a certificate of uh, organic certification from uh, whoever grew those, uh, those seedlings. And they also want to know um, as we talked about on the audit trail, you know, they'll want to see the, the seed invoice, the planting date, the seeding date, the transplant date, et cetera, all the way through the chain. Um, if you are doing any type of soil um, testing, which I hope you are, 
uh, or if you do any analysis of um, manure before you use it um, or compost before you use it that's not your own compost, uh, then you'll want to include those uh, testing documents um, as well. Um, again, the compost production records, if you're going to keep compost to use on your field, you need to keep those. Monitoring records, um, soil and water tests. Um, most certified organic farms are required to do at least um, annual water testing. Um, if you are using municipal water, that's not a requirement, but if you are using uh, wells or um, open sources uh, like open ponds or, or streams, you need to do a water test on each one of those. Um, and um, they will require that no matter what, but they are particularly sensitive about um, using those open water sources for, um, for washing vegetables. Um, equipment cleaning records is something that sometimes uh, people forget about, uh, especially if you're you know, a farm like ours where we don't have a riding tractor um, and when we open up a new field, we have a friend come over with, with their tractor to help us break ground. Um, fortunately, that farm is certified organic, so I don't need to worry about this, but if it's not a certified organic farm, where the tractor or the equipment comes from, you actually have to make sure that you are cleaning that equipment or the operator is cleaning that equipment and that there is a documentation of that cleaning. Um, sometimes this can be just power washing, um, uh, air powered um, uh, and so forth. But before they come on your field, you're going to want them to um, document the cleaning of that uh, machinery, okay? Um, we talked about harvest records that show the field date, date of harvest and amounts. And um, if you're using any labels, the labels have to be um, uh, reviewed and approved by uh, your certifier. They uh, have a particular way they like to see certified by uh, underneath the farm name and address. So um, if you are planning on using any labels, then just do yourself a favor and get those approved before you print them. Uh, save yourself some heartache and some money uh, by doing that. Um, again, storage records uh, that show the location, the field ID, and um, any cleaning activities of the, the, the storage and the transport and the shipping uh, records. And I think that was my last slide. So um, I hope I, I didn't um, put anybody to sleep there. <laughs> But I'd be happy to answer any questions that you um, you might have in regards to uh, the presentation or um, other records uh, or other uh, questions about organic certification. Or you can, I guess you can just unmute and um, or you can type in the chat box. Thank you. You're most welcome. Thank you. I'll stay on a couple of minutes just in case anybody has any questions. Hey, Laura, some people sent me some questions privately. Um, one person said, Susan said, we are in the beginning stages of thinking about this process. Do you have any advice for starting points or points to consider? Yeah, I think the, the best thing to do is um, you can download the forms from um, uh, Bay State Organic Certifiers. Um, there, there's a crop, uh, if you're doing vegetables, that is, um, there's a organic farm plan. They have a checklist 
um, and they have um, an Appendix A, which has a list of all of the crops that you're going to grow. And there's a letter there for new applicants, um, as well as a fee sheet. I would recommend you just download those uh, Word documents and, and read through them. And then um, the other thing that I would do <clears throat> is just think about if you've been managing your farm for three years, obviously you know what's been you know, put on those fields. Um, maybe check your, your list of amendments that you've been using and um, just make sure none of those are prohibited. Um, and then um, it really is as simple as just starting in on the application and starting to fill it out. I, um, I do um, help farmers with those questions when they get stuck. So if um, you need some assistance, you can certainly um, email me at, um, at um, uh, forgive me, I forget my NOFA address, Maria. <laughs> um, I think it's Laura dot. Uh, Davis at nofamath.org, um, and I'll be happy to get you unstuck with whatever questions you have. Um, and um, I, I can I give everybody at least an hour free. So after that, if you're a NOFA member, you get a reduced rate. And um, but there are some things I can answer fairly quickly if you have uh, things that that come up as you're reviewing that. But I also would like to say that. Um, um, that the the cost is not prohibited for especially if you're a small farm just starting out um uh for example um you know uh if you just think about a, a forty five thousand dollar revenue farm um you would pay about eight hundred dollars uh, per year and 75 percent of that is actually reimbursed under the farm bill in september uh we send that uh, invoice to MDAR and they send us a check back for $600. So my net cost, let's say, is about $200 for my farm. So it really is not cost prohibitive. I would not, um, people always believe that it is, but it, it, it is not. Um, and the record keeping can be a little bit onerous the first time you're sitting down to do this. But once you do it the first time, it becomes very easy and it really does become part of your daily routine. Um, as you manage your farm. Great, I got another question um, privately that says, where can we find examples of your records such as blank templates? That's from Jenny Lee. Um, I actually have a document with a bunch of different um, blank templates, which I'd be happy to send out by email. So, um, I don't know, Maria, how you how best to do that from here, but um, I can send it to you, or 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 if uh, they want to uh, give us their email, I can certainly, or we can send it out to everybody that that RSVP. Yeah, we're going to send a follow up email with the survey and a recording of this webinar, so we can include that in that email. Yes, I also have a um, an Excel sheet that enables you to calculate your carbon to nitrogen ratio. If anybody would like that, I'll send that along too. Awesome. Um, and there was another question that says, do you have any experience with any software record keeping programs? That's from Kate Canny. Um, I know I'm going to say this wrong, but I saw, um, I saw one this week and maybe they've already hung up. Um, uh, Trello, T-R-E-L-L-O, I believe was the name. Um, I don't use any of these record um, keeping software myself, although if I got much bigger, I think I would probably go to that type of um, that software. But I did see this particular one, Trello, um, at an, an inspection I was at this week, and it seemed very um, easy to use. It had a mobile feature, and um, it seems like it was open source, so I don't think there was a, um, a big fee for it. But other farms have used um, Farmigo is another one. Um, there's actually a uh, half a dozen or so of these software programs out there, uh, but they all do charge some amount of money. Um, so, but I haven't used any of them personally. Um, I don't know. 
if you can see these other questions, Laura. Oh, oh, um, yes, I do see them. Okay. Um, one other one that I got privately was from Martin Botfield saying, "When I have the Lime guy in, I have to ask. I have to ask for a copy that the truck and spreader was cleaned, even if it's applied in the fall." Yes. Yes. Okay. okay. And um, you know, uh, there was. I'll just tell you a little story. There was a a, a farm that I was helping last year uh, to put their paperwork together, and you know, I had given the person a couple of suggestions on which type of lime that they should be ordering that was already approved by Bay State. And unfortunately, they, they didn't order those two, uh, one of those two types. And when the inspector came out to inspect, they denied certification based upon the limestone that they used. And they were restricted from applying again for three years. So um, don't put something on if you're not sure absolutely that it's been approved for organic use even if you're not certified yet if you plan on being certified you want to make sure that you check those things out and i, I can also help uh, with some look up some of those if you're if you get stuck okay let's see what the other question here is Uh, product labels, how they store them. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I generally these, if they're professional labels, um, sometimes they have a graphic designer that designs labels. The question was, can you give examples of how people store their product labels? Um, so people that use a graphic designer, those um, have an electronic file that, that, that they actually can attach to their application and send it in electronically. I have seen others that just use address labels, you know, the Avery address labels where they, they're printing on their own labels. Um, so they're storing their, um, you know, that might even be a word file uh, where, they're, where they're developing their labels in. So it just all depends upon how sophisticated somebody is, um, is with their uh, label, labeling system. Um, let's see what the next question is. Okay, we have four fields, three of which have been managed for the last four years. The fourth field was managed by another uh, vegetable farmer, I believe you mean. Uh, we have managed it now for the past two years. Can we put it into our application as in transition, and will we need to have a commingling policy since we are growing vegetables on it, or should we just wait an, until next year to apply for certification? Um, that's a good question, and um, you can, when you fill out your application, they will ask you for the names of the fields and which are organic, O meaning they've been treated that way for the last three years, and um, T meaning transitional, or C meaning conventional, that you plan on keeping those fields in conventional uh, production. So you can certify and just leave that one field in transition and then it'll have a conversion rate a year later if, you've, if, if it's already two years into its transition. Um, if you're, it, be, it becomes especially tricky to manage, um, depending upon your farm, uh, if you're growing broccoli on the transitional field and you're growing broccoli on the organic field, it really becomes tricky in keeping those separate. So it's not impossible, but if you can find a way to grow something in the transitional field that you're absolutely not growing in the other field and making sure to keep that separate, um, it does become a bit of a management nightmare if you um, are not able to to keep them from commingling. But you can go ahead and apply. Uh, water container from pond to solar pump water vessel. <laughs> it uh, might be confusing. Do you want Do you want to uh, just say your question? Yeah, I'm going from a pond using solar pump. The pump pumps 230 feet uphill to a, a reservoir, plastic container. I'm just curious of what's approved and if it is approved. Um, in terms of the water or the container or both? The container. Okay. It goes so, from the container to my irrigation lines. Okay, so the container, uh, do you know what was in it when you bought it? Uh, clean as far as I understand. 
Okay. Do you know what was stored in it prior to you buying it? No. Okay. Um, sometimes um, that will come up. I know I bought one of those containers myself uh, last year, a uh, 330-gallon container, and it had a, uh, a label on it of what it had been used for in the past. And that particular uh, chemical, I looked up, and it said um, it, I, I wasn't going to have a problem, but I did also call my certifier and ask them if I could use that gallon for water. So it, it probably is going to be okay as long as there, um, if, if there's a company name on it or um, anything that identifies what was in it before, it, it would be good for you to know. Okay. Possibly. Yeah, it's it's very possible that you would um, be okay, but you would just want to check on it. And of course, the pond you would have to um, have a water test, and what they're looking for is a chloroform water test. It's going to show you if there's any E. coli in the pond. And if there is, it's not that you can't use the pond. It's just that they'll tell you that they don't want you to do overhead watering. They will only allow you to do drip irrigation. Yeah, we do drip irrigation now as it is. Okay, great. Any other questions from anybody? I will say that um, if anybody is interested in um, doing the paperwork, I know uh, people are starting to plant. We're planning next week. Um, but if you, it takes about six to eight weeks total after uh, Bay State um, receives your application uh, for them to get out and get you inspected and um, uh, get you certified. So, it, you know, it really is still possible to get certified for this um, growing season if you have the time to do the paperwork. <laughs> so I know it's getting late in the, the growing, or we're ready to plant now. But happy to answer any questions um, uh, to you. Um, there, there is a bunch of information too on um, other uh, uh, organic certification uh, tips that is that are on the NOFA website. If you just click on programs and uh, organic certification, you'll see them there. So I thank you all, and I um, I do thank you for your interest in uh, the record keeping presentation. Yep, thanks so much for being here, Laura. Um, we're going to go ahead, ahead and end the meeting now, I think. But thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you. All right.